Uh, so the next speaker is um, Alison Inglis. Alison is a graduate of the Art History Department of the University of Melbourne. She researches and publishes in the area of 19th century British art and museum studies. Her current research projects include British and colonial portraits in the uh, National Gallery of Victoria, Australian art exhibitions, 1968 to 2009, Scottish art in Australia, art and philanthropy, and the circulation of art within the British Empire. And her paper today is Scintillating Surfaces, Shell Mosaic in Australian Architectural Decoration. Thanks. I'd like to thank the conveners for their very generous um, uh, invitation to come and speak about this work. And I'd also like to acknowledge that this symposium is being held on the land of the Eora Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders and to all First Nation people in the, in the audience. Now, in this paper, I wish to consider the capacity of certain decorative materials to bring together different artistic traditions and some within a broader convergence of belief systems. In particular, I will be exploring the historical and symbolic significance of an ancient form of mosaic material, and that is shell work, or mother of pearl, which was used in Australian mural decoration during the colonial and early modern eras. In fact, as this image makes clear, shells and decorative shell murals were presented to the world as one of the defining objects of Australian material culture in 1901. And I always think this image of this marvelous array of pearl shells can be compared to the great and more famous 1862 Great Exhibition in which we had the gold pyramid celebrating the great gold rushes of the um, uh, mid-century. In spite of this fame of the Australian um, shells, pearl shells in particular, at the time of Federation, shell mosaic has received relatively little attention in recent scholarship. I would definitely consider it a marginalised media and well within the parameters of this symposium's brief. Unlike the wider subject of shell and shell work objects, we had the wonderful paper in the earlier session, but I think there has been a bit more attention in the 19th century traditions of shell work, women's work, wonderful shell objects, the overlap also with, of course, the um, indigenous communities of La Perouse. And I think also in recent times, relatively recent, we've had some very important exhibitions on the subject of shell, the great Tasmanian um, shell necklace exhibition, and also Luster, Pearling in Australia. These were two major touring exhibitions seen in most states, and I think had a real impact about how we think about and look at these, um, the issue of shells. So let's now turn to shell mosaic and its meaning at the time of its, these two productions. That's the colonial period and the early modern era. The two case studies I'm going to examine in this paper are one, a private domestic context from the 1870s, and that is the shell decoration in the interior of the Island Grotto at Werribee Park, which is to the west of Melbourne. And my other case study is a public religious space, that of the Sacred Heart Catholic Church in Beagle Bay in the Kimberley region, which dates from about 1918 onwards. I'm going to do them one after each other. So let's now think about um, shell grottos. The use of shells in European architectural decoration was most prevalent during the 18th century, particularly in grottos or ornamental garden structures known as shell houses. And I just put up here, um, a late um, 17th century, then into 18th century example of these structures. The development of the English landscape garden by Capability Brown and his followers led to a range of fantasy buildings and follies arranged in artful informality within these remodelled aristocratic parklands. Amid the temples, ruins and pagodas that dotted these estates were also grottos, which were rustic in style, often partially subterranean, 
and decorated with a form of surface decoration like flint or glass or mirrors, but especially shells. So popular indeed was the shell-lined grotto that a veritable passion for shells emerged in aristocratic circles in Britain, with inflated prices being paid for rare imported shells, especially for those from the West Indies. For example, Lord Donegal imported 10,000 pounds worth of shells in 1788. These are astronomical sums. It's like us making a grotto out of moon rock today. It's such a, you know, a, a statement, a flourish of um, aristocratic elitism. And certainly these more elaborate decorative schemes could take years to complete. Shell collectors, many of whom were aristocratic women, regularly visited each other's displays and drew up careful lists of the shells, the rarity of the shells used. The 18th century's delight in exotic and intricately designed shell work was gradually transformed during the Victorian era by a more scientific and practical approach. Garden owners began to incorporate unusual fossils or mineral specimens and man-made inventions, such as the artificial rock known as pulmonite. And they turned their grottos into rockeries or ferneries. More importantly, popular middle-class forms of shell mosaic replaced the aristocratic exotica. And I show you here the wonderful old curiosity shop in Ballarat, which has some of that patterned shell work that is slightly reminiscent of the earlier um, aristocratic period, but very much dropping down the scale, and also an example of a bit of artificial rock. Thus, the Shell House of Grotto, while an established tradition in 18th century European garden design, was very uncommon in outlying regions of the British Empire, such as Australia, which is only settled in the 19th century. And of the small number of surviving colonial garden grottos in this country that retain their original decoration, the grotto on the island in the formal garden of Werribee Park is the finest example. For those of you who haven't been to Werribee Park, it looks like this from the air. The mansion was built between 1874 and 1877 for the Scottish-born brothers Thomas and Andrew Churnside, who had the misfortune to fall in love with the same woman, but I won't go into that. They had great success as pastoralists in Victoria that resulted in considerable wealth and social status. The scale and magnificence of the family's new bluestone mansion became the setting for entertaining on a lavish scale, including dinners, balls, shooting parties, polo matches and other sporting events. They imported a red deer herd for their hunting. The garden, likewise, oh, i just show you here a bit of a deer hunt and the interior. The garden, likewise, was conceived in the grand manner to complement the house, and a number of extravagant picnics were held in the grounds during the 1880s for visitors, employees, and tenants of the vast estate. And a striking feature of the garden, and one which provoked particular admiration, was a small grotto set upon the island in the man-made lake on the east of the mansion. And we see the garden currently in the middle, and I'm going to take you on a little journey. We're walking towards it now. We're crossing the small bridge. There's the entrance. We're going inside. We realize it's lit from a skylight, and it's covered with what are now rather um, uh, surviving, but rather battered uh, shell mosaic. A contemporary account of the structure appeared in the Geelong Advertiser in 1882. I quote, the attractive grotto a short distance from the mansion was a delightful retreat. The place is richly adorned inside with almost every variety of seashell, worked in elaborate and elegant designs on the walls. The grotto is comfortably furnished, the floor being cemented and fantastically designed in knuckle bones, sheep and horses teeth and seashells, and the whole presenting a fairy-like appearance at once captivating to the eye. The grotto proved a favorite resort for the picnickers, who, having once gazed upon its interior attractions, reluctantly left what appeared to be a charmed spot." End of quote. And these were these great public picnics that the, uh, the Chernsides um, presented, but later generations of the family remembered gathering regularly in a shell grotto that plays children on. It used to be for the heat, they'd retire to the subterranean cool. And the walls were recalled as being coloured the most lovely pale emerald green we get that a bit more in some of these photos. 
illuminated by a lantern suspended from the dome ceiling. That lantern's now gone. Today, or I should just add one other thing. Another contemporary count wrote, this is the Weekly Times in 1880, of this charming ret retreat. It stated the grotto's walls were fairly studded with rare and beautiful shells gathered and arranged by Mrs. A. Churnside. And this is both echoes of that aristocratic 18th century women shell workers and also the idea that much 19th century shell work was done by women. Back I go. Today, the grotto is valued for its rarity. It's regarded as one of only two such structures in Australia. And I'll just show you a quick example of lost grottos that appeared, and some that remain but in damaged states, such as at Elizabeth Bay House. And its significance is seen to lie in it representing the transplantation of an 18th century English landscape tradition to this country possibly inspired by places like Goodwood, which we know the Chernsides visited. They were regularly returned to Britain. The grotto at Werribee Park, however, can also be regarded, I would um, suggest to you today, as the transformation or adaptation of an English tradition of gar garden ornament into a distinctly Antipodean decorative idiom. For while certain aspects of the grotto's interior, like the seashells and knuckle bones and pebbles, have direct parallels to English prototypes. These very same objects can be seen to celebrate the various types of decorative material that could be found in that particular Australian locale. Of the shells present, of the large ones on the walls, the black-lipped abalone, the blue mussel, the commercial scallop and the arc shell, as well as the smaller ones, the larger whelks, murex, moon shells, and even possibly Spengler's rock whelk. These are all obtained from the shallow bay waters of um, Port Phillip Bay and also around Victorian waters. Interesting, what, what's missing from the grotto's decoration is the turban shell. That's that lovely striped green shell with the iridescent centre, but that is found on the rock, uh, rocky um, edges of ocean beaches. So they're not going down the coast to the ocean, they're acquiring the shells locally. Similarly, while the knuckle bones were common in European grottos, the presence of sheep and horses' teeth at Werribee was surely a reference to the two main sources of Chernside wealt, their vast merino herds and extensive horse studs. And other aspects of the interior, such as the drooping she-oak um, wooden uh, components, the gum nuts and other things on the bench, just go back here so you see, here we are, there's some of the wooden elements, which are all again from the area around Werribee Park. Unlike Europe, therefore, where seashells that came from distant and exotic origins were the most prized, the Werribee Grotto's varied but more modest shells were collected from nearby beaches by Mrs. Chernside and members of her family. The local character of the shell decoration perhaps because of its long-standing association with European shell-like grottos, is often referred to as rare and beautiful. But in fact, it's not foreign, fantastic and unusual. It was in fact all about that local place. So in this first case study, and I'd better hurry up, I would argue that all the materials in the grotto's decoration at Werribee Park can be seen to represent a playful inversion of the European shell house tradition. Instead of a display of exotic and grandiose specimens from distant lands, the Chernside showcased only local examples found within their property's borders. What might seem exotic in Europe, shells and objects from the Antipodes, here, however, came to symbolize a colonial family's pride and identification in their adopted country. But there's a little twist here, because in claiming that the European tradition became in Australia a reverse of its original 18th century elitist intent. I also recognise that local did not necessarily mean familiar for new white settlers. For them, surely, Australian shells remained both local and exotic simultaneously. And I just show you these details once more. I'm now moving swiftly to my second case study which is the shell mosaic decoration of the Sacred Heart Church at Beagle Bay. I have not yet 
visited Beagle Bay. So this is really research in progress, by no means um, my final um, uh, thoughts about the matter. Even more than the Werribee Park Grotto, the Mother of Pearl mosaic in the Sacred Heart Church at Beagle Bay, created almost 40 years after the former's shellwork ornament, can be seen to encompass both European and local decorative materials and traditions simultaneously. But before examining this, let's just quickly locate ourselves. We're travelling now from Werribee Park to Beagle Bay. And here it is, Dampier Peninsula, named after, of course, the visit of Her Majesty's ship, the Beagle, there in 1838. Fifty years after the survey by the Beagle, French Trappist monks, led by Abbot Ambrose, were allowed to establish a mission at this isolated but fertile site. They went there intent on bringing Christianity to the indigenous inhabitants of the region. This is the Nul Nul people. By the 1890s, they'd set up a small school where instruction was in Nul Nul and French. But really, by the end of the century, they withdrew from the mission and were replaced in 1901 by a um, German priests and monks of the Palatine order. Let's just have a quick look at this church before we go any further. And here are the German clergy who built it. The arrival of the Palatines marked a turning point in the community's development with the establishment of a more extensive market garden and a larger school. They had the Sisters of St John of God arrive in 1907 and they decided to draw up a new mission church which would withstand the cyclone um, seasons that had destroyed the previous structure. Father Thomas Bashmere, who you see on the screen, he joined the Beagle Bay community in 1904 and was the driving force behind the proposed new building, which was of a scale and ambition, you know, quite extraordinary, but did not get underway until 1915, at the time when the Palatines were confined there on the mission as part of the wartime restriction of German residents in Australia. The Kimberley white settler, Mary Durack, would later emphasise the collaboration between the religious order and the indigenous people that made the building possible, and I quote, the design, a combined effort, was shown to the mission people as something that was to belong to them and of, they, of which they could be proud. Perhaps to please the missionaries in their time of trial, this is because they're all sort of under house arrest, they began the task with at least a show of interest. But as the building took shape, they worked with genuine enthusiasm and unprecedented constancy. Day after day, parties set off into the bush or to the coast to cut timber, cart sand, dig clay, and gather tons of broken shells for lime. 60,000 double clay bricks were shaped and baked in stone kilns, and thousands of live shells, mother of pearl, and many other varieties from small cockles, cones, and trochus to giant clams and balers for the holy water fonts were gathered in from a wide range of coastal waters and tidal reefs, end of quote. Just showing you the grandeur of the church, which is now a great tourist attraction. You see it from its two angles. Once the church was whitewashed, shells were used to decorate the interior by being embedded into the plaster or applied to the church furnishings. And in his history of the Sacred Heart Church, Frank Birrell recounts that Father Droster was responsible for covering the main brick altar with lustrous mother of pearl. And I show you here in black and white, but this is what it looks like in reality, or from these colour photographs. This is the Pinctada Maxima, the queen of all oysters, which is the beautiful gold-lipped pearl, mother of pearl that is so famous here and in Broome. These were used on not only the altar, on the side altars to St Joseph and to Our Lady. They also were had the upper parts. We had angels being shown to flank the archway. We had shells around the windows. The, it's the Church of the Sacred Heart. They represent the Sacred Heart with a shell. And we find also um, here on the, on the furniture itself, there's that clamshell font. It's just, you know, it's shell heaven. So um, the reason for the incorporation of this shell decoration, I'll just show you two, a couple more. Interesting incorporation here of indigenous onlookers uh, witnessing the passion of Christ. And you can see here, embedded within these shells, the crucifix and other aspects of the liturgy. Why did they use pearl shells? Quite literally, 
because this was the centre of world pearling at the turn of the century. Vast fleets were along this coast. Pearl shell was used to create the pearl buttons of Birmingham. And uh, this was um, a, a very lucrative industry. The um, brothers at one point attempt to um, set up their own sort of pearling industry with mixed results, but certainly this is what is happening. But the Palatines were presumably also receptive to the use of pearl shell in their mission church because of long-standing Christian associations surrounding pearls and pearl shell. In early Christian writings, the pearl could symbolise Christ himself, quote, the true pearl, the way, the truth, and our life. Even more specifically, the pearl symbolised Christ in the womb of the Virgin Mary, which meant that the mother of pearl became a symbol for the Madonna. In medieval Europe, pearls also became symbols of authority on regalia, and as attributes of Christ and the Virgin Mary, symbolising purity and chastity. And I show you a lovely pearl um, shell uh, crucifix from Perth. Wonderful, there's a whole um, tradition of carving pearl shell. And I show you again how much pearl shell encrusts and contains the material here. Interesting, the Palatines appeared to be very willing to include local elements in the decoration. One nil nil elder, Rosie Victor, recalled undertaking the shell work in the church and noted, I quote, the whole floor of the sanctuary is laid out in a pattern of squares between which are illustrations of bush fruits and animals, dugongs, turtles, fish, which Mary Durack, in her 1969 book about her youth in the Kimberley, described as tribal symbols. But we've got to be careful in how we um, uh, ascribe a black and white, this is the tribal bit and this is the European bit. Because you also get, of course, Christian use of the fish as a symbol of Christ. So the, the animals probably are animal totems, but also can have a European um, significance. But more specific, oh, and I'll just show you here in the actual um, signage around the church, they do make quite a bit about that floor with its images of um, uh, local, local uh, creatures. But more um, important than specific decorative motifs, the material of the pearl shell itself, as well as being a part of the Christian tradition, distinctly embodies, directly embodies Aboriginal belief systems. And when I quote from King Kim Ackerman's great book, Rigi and Jakuli, Kimberley Pearl Shell in Aboriginal Australia of 1947, he stresses, of course, that it's important to understand how Pearl Shell was and is perceived by Aboriginal people. A general meaning or understanding of the pearl, they are concentrated water, they are a form of animated essence, and they're perceived to be extremely potent objects. Pearl shell is water, it's flashing the lightning that precedes the summer storms. I'm quoting Ackerman. Irrespective of the uses to which the shell is put, it was regarded as an emblem of life in its own right. Water, rain, lightning, factors in the seasonal reawakening of the land after long dry periods. They're all embodied in the shell. Got about one. And one more quote. Pearl shell derived from the Kimberley then plays an important role in Aboriginal life wherever it occurs as an emblem of power as well as, as its own inherent beauty, it is shaped into highly prized ornaments. I show you today both traditional and of course contemporary use of pearl shell by the people of the communities in the Kimberley. It continues to play a vital role in rain-making rituals and it is a necessary accoutrement of people who seek via ritual to manipulate the cosmos. And that is exactly what the Christian clergy was doing in that structure, surrounded by pearl. Both sides of the community recognise pearl as a vehicle for a form of spiritual manipulation of the cosmos. So the Sacred Heart Church at Beagle Bay thus perfectly aligns in this sort of two belief systems that can use shell and mother of pearl to express ideas of spirit, renewal and power. And to swiftly conclude, I hope I've demonstrated that shell mosaic in this country has the potential to provide interplay between European and colonial identities, and more importantly, to exploit European and indigenous decorative and symbolic traditions that can result in a unique creative synthesis. 
When I called this paper Scintillating Surfaces, I was a bit worried it was a bit of a twee alliteration. But what I was trying to capture was the idea of material that had the potential to shift, to flicker, to scintillate, both visually and also in terms of its meaning and identity. And I hope I've presented Australian shell mosaic in that light this morning. Thank you.